making good progress on the st- on the uh, on the ship and the booster. Um, code name BFR. Um, Wait, what does it stand for again? Well, it's a bit of a ro- it's like sort of a Rorschach test in acronym form. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but it is very big. <laughs> yeah. And um, I gave a presentation on this at the uh, International Astronautical Congress in Australia last year. Design is evolving rapidly. We're actually building that uh, that, sh- that that ship right now. I, I think right now that like the, the biggest thing that would be helpful is um, just general support and encouragement. I think once we build it, there will be um, we'll we'll have a, uh, a a point of proof, something that. Um, other companies and countries can then go and do. Then I think they will they will up their game and they will build um, interplanetary transport vehicles as well. Uh, there's a means of getting cargo and people to and from Mars as well as to and from the Moon um, and other places in the solar system. That's really where th- there's a tremendous amount of uh, entrepreneurial entrepreneurial resources that are needed, and it's going to be harder. Um, a lot harder in a place like Mars or the Moon. I mean, the Moon and Mars are often th- th- thought of as like, is this some escape escape, escape hatch for rich people? But I, it, it, it won't be that at all. It's um, and uh, I think there's not many people who actually want to go in the beginning because all those things I said are true. Uh, but there'll be some who who will for for whom the excitement of the frontier and exploration exceeds the concern of danger. I think Mars should really have great bars, you know, <laughs> um, the Mars bar. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> we are building the first uh, ship, the first Mars um, or, inter- or interplanetary ship um, right now. And I think we'll be able, be able to do short flights, short sort of up and down flights, um, probably sometime in the first half of next year. And this is, this is a very big um, booster and ship. The liftoff thrust of this would be about twice that of a Saturn V. It's, uh, it's capable of doing... Um, 150 metric tons to, to orbit it and be fully reusable, that we can reduce the cost, modular cost per flight dramatically um, by orders of magnitude compared to where it is today. This question of reusability is so fundamental to rocketry. It is the, it is the fundament, fundamental breakthrough that's needed. You can um, lease a 747 and do a return flight uh, from Cal- full of cargo from California to Australia uh, for half a million dollars. That's what it costs to lease a 747 fully uh, round trip to Australia, which is far. Uh, to buy a single engine turboprop plane, a good one, would, would, uh, would be about one and a half million dollars. And it's tiny compared to a 747. So what that means is like a, a, it costs less to, to use a giant plane with huge cargo for a long trip than it, than it that, that costs way less than buying a small plane for a short trip in the aircraft world. And the same actually is true of rocketry. A BFR flight will actually cost less uh, than, than our Falcon 1 flight did back in the day. Um, so that was about a five or six million dollar marginal cost per flight. We were confident that BFR will be less than that. It's what will enable the creation of a, uh, a permanent base on the moon and a city on Mars. Um, and that's the equivalent of like the Union Pacific Railroad. Until you can get there, there's no way for all of the entrepreneurial energy to, um, to you, can't, you can't do anything. There's no way for all the flowers to bloom. Once you can get there, the opportunity is, is immense. Um, and, um, and, and then I think it'll be, it'll be amazing. The goal of this was to inspire you um, and make you believe again, just as people believed in the Apollo era, that anything's possible. Thank you. At SpaceX, almost all my time is spent on um, engineering and design. Um, it's probably 80 and 90 percent. In order to make the right decisions, you have to understand something. And if you don't understand something at a detailed level, you cannot make a decision. In the U.S. auto industry, the only two companies that haven't gone bankrupt, um, at, at least at some point, are Tesla and Ford. Every other company got bankrupt or was failing and got acquired. Um, there's only two companies that haven't gone bankrupt, and there's a big graveyard of companies that did. I gave basically both SpaceX and Tesla from the beginning uh, a probability of less than 10% of likely, likely to succeed. I just kept wondering why we were not making progress towards um, sending people to Mars, um, why we didn't have a base on the moon, 
just just wasn't happening year after year. Uh, it was make, it was getting me down. I look at the NASA website. I was like, does where does it say when we're going to Mars? It doesn't um, the, the genesis of SpaceX was not to create a company, but but really, how do, how do we get NASA's budget to be bigger? That was initially the goal. And as I got more and more into what it would take to do that, I learned that the fundamental um, issue is actually the cost of access to space. And there's a gigantic difference between the um, raw material cost of the rocket and the finished cost of the rocket. So there must be something um, wrong happening in, in going from the constituent at atoms to the final shape. And then, unfortunately, the, the space shuttle ended up being a counterexample of don't, of don't try to make reusability work because the space shuttle added, ended up costing more per flight than an expendable vehicle of equivalent capability. There's no question in my mind that if you could reuse the rockets, if, um, it, has to be, it has to be true reuse, which means um, rapid and complete reuse. The big orange tank, which was also the primary airframe, was discarded every time, and the parts that were reused were incredibly difficult to refurbish. Um, so that the only thing you're changing between flights, apart from scheduled maintenance, is the propellant. And uh, in the beginning, I wouldn't, actually wouldn't even let my friends invest because I didn't want to lose their money. I thought it was like budgeted for, for three flights. Um, I mean, technically, I, I did have a plan where I'd, I had, a, had, this, had the money from PayPal. I had like about $180 million from PayPal. That should be fine. I'll have $90 million. Like, that's lots, you know. Uh, but, yeah, 2008, we had the third consecutive failure of the Falcon 1 rocket for SpaceX. I, I tried very hard to, to get the right expertise in for, for SpaceX. I tried hard to, to find a great uh, chief engineer for the rocket. I didn't really have a business plan <laughs> <laughs> of SpaceX. I think Tesla's actually been, been probably two-thirds of my total, total drama dose of a, of a time. Tesla's a drama magnet. It's crazy. I think probably one of the, the, the biggest misunderstandings is that I'm, I'm actually not an investor. Um, sometimes people think I'm an investor or I invest in things. I don't actually don't invest in anything. In fact, the only uh, public security that I own of any kind is Tesla. I wanted to start the tunnel uh, from where I could see it from my office at SpaceX. So I, start, I said, well, let's just carve off a part of the parking lot across the road. Now we're making good progress. Um, and uh, we, we're finding the company for merchandise sales. Just have fun with the boring company, um, but my time allocation is, is about is literally about two percent. We are all much smarter than we think we are, but much less smart, dumber than we think we are. They, they define themselves by their intelligence, and they they don't like the idea that a machine could be way smarter than them, so they discount the idea, which is fundamentally flawed. That's the wishful thinking uh, situation. I'm really quite close to, I'm very close to the, to the cutting edge in AI, and it scares the hell out of me. Um, you can see this in things like AlphaGo, which went from, in the span of maybe six to nine months, it went from being unable to beat even a reasonably good Go player to then beating the European world champion who was ranked 600, then beating Lisa Dole 4-5, then beating the current world champion, then beating everyone while playing simultaneously. Then, uh, then there was AlphaZero, and AlphaZero just learned by playing itself, and it, it can play basically any game that you put the rules in for. If you, whatever rules you give it, just, it literally read the rules, play the game, and be superhuman. Nobody expected that rate of improvement. If you ask those, so, the, those same experts uh, who think AI is not progressing at the rate that I'm saying, I think you will find that their predictions, that, that we'll see this also with, uh, with self-driving. Uh, I think probably by end of next year, self-driving will be will encompass essentially all modes of driving and the uh, NHTSA did a study on, on Tesla's autopilot version one, which is relatively primitive, and found that it was a 45% reduction in highway accidents. The advent of digital superintelligence is one which is symbiotic with humanity. I think that's the single biggest existential crisis that we face and the, and the most pressing one. I, I'm not normally an advocate of regulation and oversight I mean, I think it, once you're generally you're on the side of minimizing those things, but this is a case where you have a very serious danger to the public. The danger of AI is much greater than the, the, the danger of nuclear warheads by a lot. Um, and nobody would suggest that we allow anyone to just build nuclear warheads if they want. That, that would be insane. And mark my words, AI is far more dangerous than nukes. Far. 
So why do we have no regulatory oversight? This is insane. I'm not really all that worried about the short-term stuff. Things that are, um, not, like narrow AI is not a species level risk, but it is not a fundamental species level risk, uh, whereas uh, digital superintelligence is. Uh, so it's really all about laying the groundwork to make sure that, um, and obviously the things that I believe in, like extending life beyond Earth, making life multiplanetary. Um, and I'm a big believer in sort of um, Asimov's foundation series or the principle that you, you really want to, we want to make sure that there's enough of a, of a seed of human civilization somewhere else uh, to bring civilization back um, and perhaps uh, shorten the length of the dark ages. The Mars base might survive. It's more likely to survive than a moon base. But I think a moon base and a Mars base um, that, um, that could perhaps help regenerate life back here on Earth would be really important and uh, to get that done before a possible World War III. Again, I'm not predicting. <laughs> it just seems like, well, if you say given enough time, will it be most likely given enough time? This, this, is, this is, has been our pattern in the past. Uh, so sustainable energy is also obviously really important. It's tautological. If it's not sustainable, it's unsustainable. Yeah, how close are we to solving that problem? Well, I think that the core technologies are, are there with the wind, solar, the fundamental problem is that there's an unpriced externality in the cost of, of, of CO2. Um, you can start off with a low price, uh, but then that price, and, and then depending upon whether that price has any effect on the parts per, million, parts per million of CO2 in the atmosphere, you can adjust that price up or down. So it's really up to people and, and governments to put, to put a price on, on carbon, and, and then automatically the right thing happens. It's, it's really straightforward. M more carbon in the atmosphere is, is actually good, but up to a point. Well, right now, the only things that are really stressing me out in a big way are AI, obviously. Um, that's like always there. And, uh, and uh, I'm working really hard on Tesla Model 3 production. Um, and uh, we're making good progress, but it's hugely hard work. But those are the two most stressful things in my life right now. But we, we do want a close coupling between collective human intelligence and digital intelligence. Um, and I, Neuralink is trying to help in that regard by um, creating a, an interface between, um, a high bandwidth interface between AI and, your, and human brain. So there's, there's got to be essentially vast numbers of, of, of tiny electrodes uh, that are able to read write from your brain. Of course, you know, security is pretty important in the situation, to say the least. Um, I was going to say, I'm not coming with. I'm keeping my brain air-gapped. Yeah. Well, I think a lot of people will choose to do that. Uh, that is an AI. The AI extension of you, uh, a tertiary layer of intelligence. Um, so you've got your limbic system, your cortex, and, and the tertiary layer, which is the digital AI extension of you. And that high bandwidth connection is what um, achieves a tight symbiosis. I, I think that's the best outcome. I, we don't talk that much about Starlink, but essentially it's intended to provide low latency, high bandwidth internet connectivity throughout the world. Um, that, there actually will not be enough cognitive processing power on board the satellite system to, to uh, in any way be a Skynet thing. Like it's the, <laughs> um, the Starlink system will be important in providing the funding necessary for SpaceX to develop um, interplanetary spacecraft. Um, and at the same time, yeah, h helping people who have either no or super expensive connectivity and giving people in urban areas more of a competitive choice. The form of government on Mars would be somewhat of a direct democracy where um, you vote on issues, where, where people vote directly on issues instead of going through representative government. In, in, you know, when the United States was formed, representative government was the only thing that was logistically feasible, because peop there's no way, it was no way for people to communicate instantly. Uh, a lot of people didn't even have really access to, uh, but I think on Mars most likely it's going to be people, everyone votes on every issue, and that's how it goes. Uh, there are a few things I'd recommend, which is keep laws short. Um, long laws, it's like, that's, that's something suspicious is going on if there's a long law. <laughs> you know, if, if you're, 
if the size of the law exceeds the word count of Lord of the Rings, someone's... <laughs> <laughs> well, put the grad studies on hold and do something um, to help build the internet or do something useful on the internet. Um, and that's um, when I talked to Kimball and um, you were working in Canada at the time. Yeah, that's right. Um, and uh, I said, hey, why don't we try to do this, this company in Silicon Valley? And that, uh, in fact, that, that's where I decided you really want to go to the end consumer. If you've got great technology, you want to go all the way to the end consumer. Uh, don't tell it to, to, to some bonehead legacy company that doesn't understand how to use it. Either solar, electric car, or space. Um, I thought space was like the least likely to have somebody at least likely to attract um, entrepreneurial talent. I thought like, like nobody is gonna be crazy enough to do space, so I better do space. Um, so I started off with, with space first. Um, Harold had done something called Rosen Motors, which was like an attempted EV startup. And I said, well, I've always been super interested in electric vehicles. I was gonna do my PhD on um, in advanced energy, energy storage. I was gonna do grad studies on on advanced energy storage techniques for electric vehicles. And, um, and so JB said, well, have you heard of this company called AC Propulsion? Because uh, they had created um, a, the T0 electric sports car as a prototype. Like lithium ion batteries had really achieved a level of energy density that could, um, for the first time could allow you to have significant range in, in an electric car. Um, and they had a, a sports car that had zero to 60 in under four seconds, a 250 mile range. So I got the test drive from AC Propulsion, and I was like, wow, you guys should really commercialize this. This would show people what electric cars can do. And I tried for months to get AC Propulsion to um, go into production with the T0. But the problem is like the electric Scion would, co would cost $70,000. Um, or you could build a sports car for $100,000. Okay, but like nobody's going to buy the electric Scion. If you're going to go and try to productize T0, there's some other teams you should talk to that are also interested in doing that. Um, so that's where um, Martin Everhart, Mark Topping, and Ian Wright came in. Um, and uh, and that, I think that was probably the biggest mistake in my career, quite frankly. Um, I'll dedicate 20% of my time to Tesla, and that'll be fine. Um, but actually, uh, it, it didn't. Um, things really melted down. Went through hell. We had to recapitalize the company. And Kim was there seeing it in real time. But the truth is stranger than fiction. All the crazy stuff you see in that show, Silicon Valley, the reality is way crazier than that. <laughs> yeah, you've seen it too, right? Thank you. Yeah.